All right. Good morning. 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 Ah, I like that. Let's do that again. Good morning. 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 Yeah, just very enthusiastic. Good morning from this side of the room. Uh, All right. So something is strange about this picture. Scoot over. Oh, wait. I see. All right. Good. I was going to bug. Definitely going to bug me. Okay. So. Uh, Today and Friday, we're going to talk about virtualization. Uh, It's the last little thing we get to cover. Uh, It's really cool. I wish I had two weeks to talk about virtualization, but we have two days. So we're going to do our best. Uh, uh, Keep things at probably a fairly high level for the next couple days. Uh, Hopefully, that won't bother anybody. The the, the details get kind of gooey. Uh, But what I'm going to try to do is give you some sense of, of what the objective is and why this is interesting, why we'd want to do this, and some of the techniques that are used to actually accomplish this. Right? So how many, just by a show of hands, how many people have some idea what they think virtualization is? Hardware virtualization. Right? Ah, OK, good. How many people, well, actually, how many people have used hardware virtualization recently? Everybody's hand should go up. Right? If you're working on the assignment, right? <laughs> if you're not, then OK. Well, then you have other problems. Um, all right, so, so we'll just talk a little bit today about some of the details and sort of get you started with this because it's, it's cool stuff, right? And it's definitely really relevant to operating systems that operate system design, certainly, in, you know, in this century, right? Um, all right, so a couple of announcements. So next Monday, I've decided we'll do an exam review session from 8 to 10 a.m., right? Uh, that is not a typo, John. That is the uh, actual uh, time for the review session. And that's also the time for the exam, sadly. Um, so that is, and this will give you guys some practice in the art of waking up even earlier than you've been waking up all semester, right? I really uh, don't want you guys wandering in at 9 a.m. on exam day, right? That would be tough on you guys. Um, so anyway, so, and I'm also just not going to tape this, right? Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is to encourage people to come. It's the only time I've done this all semester, so don't give me a hard time about it. And the second, more uh, probably you know, defendable reason is simply the video camera battery only lasts 80 minutes, right? So I can't tape the whole thing. Um, and so the exam is going to be on all the material we're going to cover up to Friday, right? I mean, we, you can, and you can think you know, proportionally about what's going to be on the exam. We've done, we're going to do two lectures on virtualization, what percentage of the class that is. I think we'll have done a total of 36 lectures. So, you know, I mean, it, there's not going to be massive amounts of stuff on the exam about this, but there probably will be some. Um, and then finally, how many people have got a link to the feedback form for the class? I think everybody should have got this. OK, so I would love if people would provide feedback. This is the first time this class has been taught. Uh, there's uh, parts of it that I think have gone well. There's other parts that have been little mini ongoing disasters. Uh, so uh, some of those things I know about, but other things I think it would be great if you guys could, could help me find out. So I'm assuming the feedback is anonymous. Um, so please go on ahead, fill that out. And, and again, I'll come up with some sort of uh, either self-effacing uh, or point uh, distributing incentive if, if the class participation rate gets above a certain percentage. Right? I don't know what it's at now. I haven't checked recently. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe if we can get to like 75% or something, then I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. Right? I'm sure Calvin or so one of these guys will have a good idea of something embarrassing that I can do. Um, yeah, a lot of anger built up. Um, all right, so quick review of performance analysis and improvement. So we, we spent a few lectures on that. You know, maybe went a little bit too slowly, but anyway, we're finished with it. And do people have any? questions about uh, that material? Any questions about performance analysis and improvement? Something that you can probably expect to see in some form on the exam as well as in later in life. OK, so how do we do it? You know, you guys just told me you, you don't have any questions about it. So how do we improve the performance of a system or a component of the system or anything, right? What, are, what were our steps? What's the recipe? Step, what's the first thing we have to do? First thing we have to do, get started. Measure. We have to measure something, right? We have to hopefully, hopefully measure the thing that we're trying to improve, right? So we have to measure the system. And, and how, do we, you know, how do we go about doing that, right? What are some of the challenges inherent in measurement? What are some of the stumbling blocks? People remember? Sean. 
Right, right. So I have to, I, OK, so it's great. I have to choose what to measure, right? Do you remember what my choices were? I had three options. What can I measure? So Sean got one of them, models. There's two more. Right side of the room. Simulations, simulations is another one. Left side of the room. Models, simulations. What's the third thing that I could measure? Potentially. I hear somebody whispering something that sounds right. What's that? The real system, right? The actual thing, right? That, that's, that's a useful thing potentially to measure, right? So I've got to choose what to measure, and then what else do I have to do? I have to choose what environment to measure things in. Michael? Oh, no, no. Don't go to step two yet. We're still in step one, right? All right. So I, I, I picked, let's say I'm going to run simulations. OK, now what do I do? What's the next step? Windows sound. What's that? Oh, it was a Mac sound. OK, sorry. I should know what it sounds like. All right, don't get distracted. <laughs> I've got a simulator. I've decided on a simulator. What do I need to do now? What is it going to do? Keep, hopefully keep running, right? But what is it going to be doing while I measure it? Well, I'm going to collect data about it, but like, what, is, what is it going to, what, what are the, what's the input, right? What do we call these things? Inputs to systems frequently used during performance testing. Test cases, no. Somebody knows the answer. Benchmarks. benchmarks. All right. So I've got to choose some benchmarks. I need to decide what the system is going to be doing while I measure, right? And I probably need to pick some measurement tools, right? I need to get a measurement harness set up so that I can actually measure the time it takes or the, some, some variable of interest to the system, right? So we talked a little bit about all these different challenges. All right. Now, analyze the results. So Michael got us there a little fast. What are the challenges here? Got, so I've collected some data. Now I'm going to sit down and look at the data, right? No problem. What are some of the pitfalls, challenges, best practices? Measurement analysis, John. I don't want to ignore outliers, right? Love your outliers, right? The outliers have potentially something to tell you. They're, they're not just noise, right? They might be important. OK, what else? Yeah, beware of summary statistics, right? Don't compute statistics over data sets before you look at them, right? Look at them, examine them closely, right? So I think you guys got this, right? Use appropriate statistical techniques, right? Don't, don't you know, summarize data before you understand the data, OK? All right, now, final step. What's the final step? Improve the system, right? Improve the slow parts, no problem, right? What do, how, do, how do I do this? What are the two steps to doing this, the two little sub-steps, right? Identify the slow parts. Identify the slow parts, right? And then, and then what? Right, so I need to think about Amdahl Solve, which we're going to come to in a second, and then make them faster. Right? So we talked about some ways, hints, potential uh, ways to improve things, make things faster. Right? What is one, and I should have put this in the last slide, what is one potential way uh, of making, so we, we've talked a lot in this class about sort of the, the, the keep it simple, stupid principle, right? And I've been encouraging people to apply this to assignment three, right? Uh, you know, don't use a fancy data structure where a simple data structure will do. When you're improving the performance of the system, when might that rule break down? What's one case where I might want to use a fancy data structure? If it's faster, if it's faster right? So one way to improve performance that, that I forgot to include in the last set of slides is simply use a more sophisticated data structure, right? You know, you started off with something simple, you were doing this, you were walking this whole linked list to look up something, and then you realized that those lookups were really what was killing you. Now is the time to go in and put your sophisticated data structure, because now is when you know that you need it, right? It turns out that probably what you'll find is if you start off with simple data structures throughout your programs, a lot of them never stop being simple, because they just don't matter for performance, right? And you won't know what matters up front. All right, so three formulations of Amdahl's law. Right. Well, what was the? Uh, oh, shoot. Okay. What was? So, what was the original sort of colloquial formulation 
of Amdahl's law that we came up with. Amdahl's law. Who can explain Amdahl's law? I think if someone explains it to me, that'll be colloquial enough. Right, right. Okay, so I, I like that. It's, it's, it's got most of it in there, right? So the, the colloquial statement of this was simple. The, the impact of any effort that you're making to improve system performance is constrained by the parts of the system that you're not working on, right? And that's frustrating because you're working on one part of the system, right? And, and you're, you know, but the system, the rest of the system is not going to slow down because you're not working on it, right? Sorry, it's not going to speed up. It might slow down, right? What's an even more colloquial statement of Amdahl's law. That's another way of, of, of restating that same thing. Or, or what, was, what was the general sort of design principle that we came up with, right? What is Amdahl's law really telling us about our intuition, about you know, the, the powers that we have as scientists? What is Amdahl's law telling us, Amdahl's law really telling us not to do? Anybody back here? But even, so when I'm deciding what to improve, what should I not do? What should I not rely on? What's the one thing that will let you down over and over and over again when you try to improve the performance of a system? Say it's something you wrote. What's the temptation? What's the temptation that will allow you to avoid all of this painful benchmarking and measurement and simulator development and all the things? What, what could you do instead? Yeah. Just work on the part of the system that you want to work on, right? Work on the part that you think is slow, right? Work on the part that you remember being messy and gross, right? So on some level, Amdahl's law tells us to you know, ignore your intuition, right? Ignore the parts of the system that you think are gross and ugly and slow, that you think are broken, that you remember not being happy with. Those parts don't matter to the computer. Right? What matters to the computer is what code paths are being executed. Right? And you don't know what's doing the most damage. You know what you remember not liking, right? but you don't know what actually really matters. Right? All right, finally, what was the sad sort of corollary of Amdahl's law? that forces us to rerun this benchmarking cycle over and over again. Right? So OK, so I followed Amdahl's law. I have picked the part to improve. I'm making some improvements. I've, I've sped up that part of the system. Now what's my problem? I'm not working on the right part of the system anymore. Right? As soon as I made some improvement to one part of the system, assuming that I have several parts of the system that are contributing to the speed of the system, and, and, and one of them is completely dominant. As soon as I've worked on one part, I've got to step back, rebalance, and figure out what to do next. Right? Because as soon as I've sped up one part of the system, I'm not working on the right problem anymore. Right? So you have to stay in this tight loop. Right? You don't run your benchmarks and do your analysis and get obsessed with one particular module. Right? You run those, you rerun them when you're done making your changes, and you figure out, OK, what's the next mole I need to whack? Right? What's the next thing at the top of the to-do? OK, cool. Any other questions about performance analysis and improvement? All right, stuff must be just really breathtakingly obvious. OK, so today I'm going to introduce you to the concept, or, or I think people un think they understand it, or probably do understand it, right? So, so we're, today we're going to talk about hardware virtualization, right? And virtualization itself is, is a broader term, right? And we've actually, toward the end of the class, we'll come back to a way that we've used the idea of virtualization in, in this class. Right? Virtualization has to do with creating levels of indirection. When we talk about hardware virtualization, right, what we're talking about is the ability to create a hardware virtual machine. So throughout the class, what we've been talking about primarily are operating systems that run on physical machines, physical machines, real collections of hardware that the operating system has privileged access to and controls in their entirety. Right? I mean, when you install Windows or when you install Mac on your machine, you couple the operating system to that actual physical machine. Okay? And that operating system, again, has all the privileges that it needs to multiplex resources and support applications, et cetera, et cetera. Right? 
And you know, these are, again, I mean, here, here's one way of, of thinking about what a physical machine is. Real hardware resources, we give the operating system exclusive access to, and the operating system communicates with those resources through, through, through the hardware interface, right? We've talked a lot about what the operating system interface is, right? But hardware also has an interface, right? CPUs have instructions that they support. Devices have commands that they, are, they allow you to send, right? OK. So, and, and, it, and it turns out that if we, if we are careful about how we set things up, we can also run operating system inside these virtual machines. And the terminology becomes a little bit confusing here because there's two very, I think when I started to learn this stuff, this really threw me off, right? There's two very similar acronyms that we start to use, right? One is virtual machine or VM. The other is a virtual machine monitor, OK? The virtual machine monitor is a piece of software, right? The virtual machine itself is really almost an abstraction, right? A virtual machine is a set of virtualized resources that looks like a real machine. And if we do our jobs right, if we write our virtual machine monitor correctly, the virtual machine itself can look so real that we can actually run a real operating system inside that virtual machine, right? We can actually run a real unmodified operating system that is used to running on real hardware. We can run it inside a virtual machine on virtualized hardware. Right? So this, this, is, this is the thing to keep in mind. We'll talk a lot more about VMMs than we will about VMs, right? because VMM is, is really the kind of interesting software component. Right? A few other pieces of terminology. So we talk, when we talk about the operating system that's running inside the virtual machine, we refer to that as the guest operating system. Okay? Um, for, the type, for the type of virtualization we're going to talk, today, talk about today, there is a real host operating system. Right? So the host operating system is running on the real hardware. Right? The host operating system runs on real hardware and has full access to that real hardware. The guest operating system runs inside a virtual machine with the assistance of a virtual machine monitor and has access to virtualized hardware. Right? And you know, as you might imagine, I mean, virtual machines differ from physical machines. In, in a lot of really important ways, right? So a virtual machine does not provide the guest OS with this exclusive privileged access to the underlying physical machine that it's used to. The virtual machine provides the guest OS with access to a subset of the hardware or a certain portion of the memory, right? Or some piece of the system or, in certain cases, virtualized devices that we'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow, right? And again, almost an equivalent formulation of this is they don't give the guest OS privileged access to the system. If they did, then the whole concept of this virtual machine would, would, would be really kind of silly, right? Because essentially, the guest OS would be like, hey, you know, this is my machine, right? You know, I know that there's this host OS down there that's supposed to be in charge, but you put me on here, and now I'm going to take over, right? And, and I can think of a few things uglier than trying to run, you know, several real operating systems on the same machine. That just sounds like a recipe for total chaos, right? Um, so so we, we cannot, and one of the big challenges here is we have to take these programs, right? The operating system is a program. We have to take these programs that are used to having privileged access to hardware and figure out how to safely you know, take away that privilege so that they can run safely inside a virtual machine. Right? This is one of the big challenges, OK? So the virtual machine monitor, right, the VMM, is a piece of software, right? So the virtual machine is an idea, it's an abstraction. The virtual machine monitor is something that people write, right? It's a piece of software. And the idea is that the virtual machine monitor is in charge of creating a virtual machine, OK? And that virtual machine can't, there are certain cases where that virtual machine, you can run anything inside of it, right? You could run an application inside of it. Like if you had, you know, there were old games that people used to run on, you know, people like me who are, you know, semi-ancient, right? Does anyone remember, has anyone ever used like an Apple II computer? You know, like a 2GS, 2E. You know, these, these computers, they didn't have operating systems, right? They were, they were disk-based machines. So you put in a disk, you booted it up, and the operating system, the, the computer just started executing the instructions that were on this floppy disk, right? And so every application, there was really no, it, it was a kind of a single use computer, right? If you booted up the game, you finished the game, you turned off the computer, and if you wanted to switch to your word processor, you booted it up with the word processor disk in, right? And if you wanted to play the game again, you shut down the computer, took out the word processor disk. So there was really no notion of multi-programming or multi-processing on these old machines, right? 
So, and, 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 these, and these, I'm assuming that these games didn't really have a little operating system built into them. That would be kind of dumb. They just assumed that they would have privileged hardware access. So one thing that we could do with virtual machines is use them to play old Apple II games, right? That seems kind of like a dumb, dumb use. But, um, but anyway, but normally when we talk about virtualization, we're talking about virtual machines that are, that are real enough that you can run entire operating systems inside of them. Right, but that's not always the case. You can imagine virtual machines that are missing some critical features that the operating system would need to function, but can run applications. Right? But in this case, we're, today we're going to talk about virtual machines that are so real, right? so real, and, and so, uh, so similar to the underlying physical hardware that you can run other operating systems inside them alongside other applications on your system. Right? All right. And, and again, I mean, this, this kind of comes back to this idea that the operating system, and hopefully I've convinced you of this this semester, the operating system is not this mythical creature, right? The operating system is a piece of software, right? It's a piece of software that executes instructions. It's just another program, right? And, you know, again, I mean, you've been using your virtual box, virtual machine, right? That's running a, you know, uh, an un, I don't know if it's unmodified or not. I think it is pretty much unmodified version of Linux inside there, and that unmodified version thinks that the resources that you've provided to it is what the machine is. It's like, hey, this is great. You know, I'm running a you know, circa 1990 machine with 512 megs of RAM, right? Like, too bad that you know, the future hasn't dawned on this person, but you know, like that, the, the operating system really has no idea. Maybe. But certainly has little enough idea that it can run relatively unmodified inside of that virtual machine. Right? All right. So, I know that there's this big sort of lingering question of how on earth do we accomplish this, right? But I just want to motivate the, the, why this is cool, right? Because this is actually a really exciting area. There's a, still a lot of really interesting stuff going on. I mean, you guys have probably heard about EC2, and there's all these different types of, uh, you know, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, right? The cloud, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is, this is all really exciting stuff, right? But, but let's, and, and maybe I think we kind of probably have, have, maybe from watching too many IBM commercials or something, we probably internalize some of the reasons for doing this. But let's, let's review them, right? Because it's hard, right? There's, there's some effort that went into this, and so it's worth talking about why did we bother, right? Was just this, this just the product of geeks like me who wanted to like, run Microsoft Windows in its own little protected container and run old Apple II games? No, I mean, there are a lot of good reasons. For this. Okay. So, so again, we've been talking about operating systems all semester. We've learned about how awesome they are and how great they are about you know, multiplexing resources and, and, and uh, providing uh, really nice interfaces for applications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So why would we want to kind of ditch them in favor of this new idea of, of virtualization? Um, and, and there's a number of reasons, and a lot of those reasons, so I'm going to start off with a couple slides that are really kind of weaknesses of operating systems themselves, right? And then we'll talk about, kind of, we'll flip it around and talk a little bit more about the positive things of virtualized environments, right? So, so again, I mean, just for the sake of argument, what are some of the weaknesses or problems with operating systems that we've, as we presented them, right? I mean, yeah, and they seem great. You know, they seem like they're really, uh, you know, a nice solution, but, but what are some problems? And in particular, uh, think about hardware coupling, right? So what are some problems with operating systems in, in, in the way that we've described, right, in terms of, like, installing an operating system on a machine? Uh, what, are, what are some of the limitations or weaknesses of this model? Okay. Oh, okay. That, that, actually, that's yeah. That's a really interesting point. That, that's something I thought of, right? So you have to support a lot of different hardware, right? There's a lot of different real devices, and we're talking about real systems with real devices in them, right? So, you know, I have to, you know, have a different different device driver for, for every stupid nick that's on the market, right? If you're Microsoft, and that's kind of terrible, right? But what else, right? I mean, what 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 is this? What is strange, kind of, about this world of computers that we're used to using, right? You have a computer, right? It's a set of hardware resources. And, and what, is, what is kind of like in, intimately coupled with that computer, right? What's that? The OS. the OS, right? I mean, you, we, you know, your machine is not fundamentally a Windows computer, right? Or a Mac computer or a Linux computer. It's a processor, memory, set of, you know, devices, a couple disks, whatever. Right? 
And but the problem is that we've kind of like embedded the identity of the software that runs on this machine, and we've coupled it with the hardware that's there, right? So how many people have run things like Boot Camp or you know, Parallels or whatever on their machine? So I mean, the, these solutions provide some limited ability to sort of dual boot or, you know, I remember when I was in college, it was like the holy grail was the triple boot. Although I don't remember what we were triple booting into. I mean, maybe it was like, now maybe it's a triple boot. Mac, Windows, and Linux all running on the same machine, right? Woo -hoo. But what do you have to do to switch between them? Reboot, yeah, that's kind of a pain, right? So, so not necessarily super, super awesome. So essentially, again, I mean, we've taken these bundles of hardware resources that are much more flexible, and we've embedded an operating system on top of it, right? And you know, at some level, that, you can think about that as being bad. I mean, what happens, right? What, uh, you know, you, you install Mac on your machine, and what have you done? What have you, what have you done that you might, might regret later? You have a Mac? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, okay, so what about having a Mac might you, might you regret, right? What's that? You can't play games. Can't play games? Okay, yeah, yeah no, that's a good point, right? You can't, there's some games that you can't play because you know, they only run on Windows. There's a lot of software that, that still is unfortunately tied to particular environments, right? I mean, you can't use Internet Explorer, which is really what everybody wants to do, right? No, no, I mean, I, I, kid, I kid you not. I have, a, I have a Windows 7 virtual machine on my desktop that is for one reason only, which is that there is this totally broken website that my department uses to book travel that only works on Internet Explorer, right? It's like, how many websites on earth are left that are like that, right? Oh, man. I mean, nothing else. Doesn't work on Safari, doesn't work on Firefox. I thought it was just fundamentally broken. I couldn't believe it. And then I, you know, I, I borrowed a friend's computer at Internet Explorer and it worked. I was like, oh my god, this is terrible. So anyway, I mean, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some things like that out there. So yeah, if you really wanted to use Internet Explorer or whatever, or some game or, or some piece of software, you would, you would be stuck, okay? What about... You know, what, what about what happens if you get a new machine? What, what do you have to do? You have to set it up the way you like it. You have to reconfigure everything, right? There's not this idea of just somehow being able to, you know, grab your entire environment and just plop it somewhere else, right? That could be nice, right? And then what about, what about hardware provisioning, right? What about, so, so think about things like, you know, uh, like an automobile, right? An automobile, it's, it's like, I need the car today, so I take the car. Tomorrow my wife needs the car, so she takes the car. Um, what if you could do that with, can you do that with things like memory? You know, I, I guess you could, you know. You know, my wife and I could have some memory sticks at home that are kind of our shared memory sticks, and when I need the big memory stick, I stick it in my computer, right? And when she needs it, then she sticks it in her computer, whatever. But that's kind of gross, right? I mean, what do you have to do to get that to work? <laughs> I mean, literally do. What do you have to do? I have talked to my wife. Yeah, that's, that, 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 <laughs> that part's easy, right? We might fight a little bit over who gets the memory today, right? We have to, you know, we, yeah, we'd have to have some sort of like way to figure out whose computer is actually slower, and, you know, at the given moment. But, but what else do you have to do? Like, I have, I have this nice Mac, right? How easy is it to get memory in and out of that thing? It's impossible, right? It probably violates my warranty, and there's like 60 screws that are specific to Mac, and I don't know whatever. I'm going to find something dead buried in there. Anyway, so the, the point is that this is gross, right? So, so flexible hardware provisioning is, is really, really hard when you have these systems that are tightly coupled between hardware and software, right? So here, 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 are, my, here are my lists, all right? So again, you have this coupling between hardware resources and the operating system. You know, hardware is hardware. Hard, a computer is a collection of hardware components. The operating system is software. There's no reason a priori that we need to embed the software so far in there that it's really hard to get out, which is kind of what we do now, right? Um, you know, if you wanted to run multiple operating systems at the same time on the same machine, that's hard. This is a little geeky, right? This is a little one of those things where it's like not everybody is a weird computer scientist, so this is not like a super compelling reason. Um, it's difficult to transfer entire setups to another machine, right? I mean, how many, how many people have ever installed a piece of software? Okay, how many people have ever installed a piece of software that required you to install like 80 other things, right? And that took, you know, most of your day and sometimes your entire weekend, right? So that's a pain in the butt, right? Um, it, it's really gross trying to tailor hardware to the needs that you have at a particular moment, right? On, on your PC, this is not much of an issue, but think about servers, right? I mean, some servers, you know, have two hours of the day where they're heavily loaded and the rest of the day they're pretty, they're pretty lightly loaded. And this is really hard to do when I've got this tight coupling between hardware and software, 
Okay? And again, so what this means is that I do this static upfront provision of machine resources. When I buy a laptop, I need a laptop that's big enough to fit everything I could possibly do with it. Right? If you, all right. <laughs> okay, so, so what else? Let's talk a little bit about application isolation. So this is another kind of weak area of operating systems, potentially. We've talked through the semester about one of the things that operating systems are trying to do is protect applications from each other. And in certain cases, that is true, right? So what are, what are parts of the system where the app operating system does a pretty good job of isolating applications from each other? Processor, right? I mean, processor is easy. I yank something off the processor. I remove all traces of its execution, and I start something else running, right? So we had this nice idea that I'm creating the illusion that every process has its own CPU, right? What else? What other part of the system is pretty, we're pretty good at? What? Virtual memory, right? So memory, again, I mean, to some degree, memory doesn't provide perfect isolation, and neither does process scheduling, because there's still one resource, and I've still got to divide it up between processes. So that, you know, if one process gets really piggish, it can affect other processes. But the, and, and for these resources, we're pretty good. What resources aren't we as good at? What's that? So, so, so there are certain pieces of hardware, but I have, I have one particular part of the system in mind. That I'm, I'm curious about, right? So again, we're, we're concerned about this lack of true isolation between multiple applications. What's one big part of the system where changes that are made are visible to everybody? On the disk, right? File systems. We don't provide processes with their own file system. We give them a file, view of the file system, and they may not have the right privileges to change parts of the file system. But again, there's all sorts of you know, uh, information that operating systems essentially leak between multiple processes. Sometimes this is on purpose, right? I mean, operating systems weren't really designed to completely isolate applications from each other because applications work together to do things on the system, so that's not necessarily something that we would want to do, okay? So, you know, and again, again, go back to the uh, software installation. How many people have installed a piece of software that had requirements that broke every other piece of software on the machine, right? You know, like something needs Python 3.0, something needs Python 2.6, something needs this library, that library. So, so this, again, this gets kind of gross. And the reason that this gets gross, on some level, is the file system is shared, and this is where this stuff gets installed, right? And if you're not careful, you end up with things that are, you know, you update a package that's used by somebody else. It's really difficult sometimes to avoid doing this, right? Um, the other thing is that, you know, certain applications, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about some uh, uh, kernel structure models, certain applications have really specific requirements, right? So certain applications may really want to tailor the performance of the operating system to their, to their own needs. And to some degree, this goes so far as to say, I remember I was, you know, the, I, I was somewhere listening to the guy who, one of the guys from the Zen team, which is, came up with one of the big, interesting approaches to virtualization we'll talk about Friday, talked about, you know, the fact that there are certain pieces of software where if you run that piece of software on a machine that has anything else running on it, you are violating the terms of service, right? Like you, you know, if you have Microsoft, I'm just gonna pick an example, I don't know if this is true, but if you were gonna install like Microsoft SQL Server, right, the only supported configuration is if it is the only application running on the entire system, right? Otherwise, something else weird could be happening. You know, like you're trying to run a web server and you're running SQL Server. No, 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 can't do that. Right? So, so what ends up happening here? Right? You're a, you're a, uh, you know, a, you know, pre-virtualization. You're a company. You're trying to set up some sort of web uh, website with the back end. You've got a database server. You've got a web server. You've got a file server. What, what, what does your server room end up looking like? What's that? A big mess of what? Machines, right? One machine to run the SQL server. Another machine to run the web server. A third machine to run the file server. A fourth machine is, you know, and it just it goes on and on, right? And each machine, you know, what's the likelihood you're going to get the right configuration for each machine? It's tiny, right? You start to realize, oh, my web server is a bottleneck. Well, now you've got to buy a new machine for the web server, right? So this gets, this gets really, really gross. So, Virtualization, you know, in, in addition to giving us some sort of geeky properties as far as, you know, the ability to run multiple operating systems and stuff like that, has a lot of really nice features, right? There's a lot of nice things that come along in the box with virtualization, right? Um, one is that essentially we can do what I did for you guys this semester with your, with your VM. You can package and distribute an entire environment as is, right? So 
I could put together the software tools. I didn't have to put up instructions. And I knew when you guys booted up that virtual machine that everything would be exactly as I left, right? Which is nice, right? Because it actually took me a couple of days to figure out how to get the stupid tools to compile. Um, you can take, one of the nice things that companies love, of course, is that you can dynamically divide up, and the, the degree to which you can do this dynamically varies, but on some level, you can divide up one large machine. You can buy one big machine, and you can divide it up into little pieces and hand those pieces out to, to people or to different uh, uses, right? So rather than the four machines, I have one big machine, and the machine runs multiple virtual machines. One of them runs a web server, one of them runs a file server, whatever. Each of them can be tuned individually for its own application. And then the other nice thing is virtualization gives us a way to kind of freeze and encapsulate the entire state of a machine, meaning that once I've done that, I have a disk image, essentially, some file that represents the entire state of virtualized hardware. And I can move that to another machine and restart it. I can branch it. You know, I can duplicate it. And essentially, again, what I did when I distributed the thing to you is I took one machine, one virtual machine, and it suddenly became, you know, 100. And this is something, and, and every one of those booted up, you know, I mean, I, I think I shut it down before I distributed it, but if I had distributed a snapshot, it would have booted up, you know, into the exact same place, right, where, where I had left it, which can be really nice. All right. So, and, and the idea of, of, you know, the other thing I, I don't want to give the impression of is that this is a new idea, right? So virtualization as a concept has been around for a long time, right? And in 1974, uh, there were two computer scientists that essentially provided three requirements for a virtual machine monitor, right? These are, these are kind of design requirements in order to implement a virtual machine monitor. The first is, remember, the virtual machine monitor is in charge of creating a virtualized machine, creating a virtual environment, okay? The first thing is the virtual environment has to be realistic. So an application or an operating system running inside the VM cannot be able to distinguish the VM from a real system, except maybe with some timing things, right? I mean, timing is not going to be quite right because I'm, I'm going to play some games underneath the, the covers. But essentially, the software on the VMM should execute identically to how it would on real hardware, OK? The second requirement is performance. So, so go back up to Fidelity. What is one way of solving this problem? And in fact, what is, what is one way of solving this problem that you guys are currently using? It is not virtualization, something a little bit different. I want to provide a complete emulate, oops, sorry, I almost said the answer. I want to provide a complete you know, virtual machine that, that, that faithfully uh, behaves like a piece of real hardware. Right? What's one way to do it that, again, you guys are using daily, I hope? I can emulate it, right? So System 161 is a MIPS emulator. Every m instruction that your kernel executes, until it panics, um, is emulated by that piece of software, right? So that software is not virtualization. That software is emulation. The problem with emulation is it is really slow, right? I mean, your machines don't run that fast. We're talking about like a, a, a bare bones kernel running inside an emulator. So emulators in, it can introduce, you know, hundred, hundreds to thousands to ten of thousand factor slowdowns, right? in taking an instruction and figuring out how to emulate it properly, right? So emulators are not an option here. The performance is just too bad. And the way that we achieve performance in a virtualized environment is that we run as many instructions as we can on the real hardware, OK? And what we'll talk about it, uh, today and maybe on Friday is figuring out which instructions we can't run on real hardware and figuring out what to do about those instructions, right? But most instructions, you can imagine. I mean, if you look at the instruction stream that's being generated, by something running in a virtual machine, a lot of those instructions are safe to execute directly on the hardware, right? All they do is they modify registers, and so it just looks like a regular application, right? But there are instructions, and in particular, there are instructions that the guest operating system is going to want to use that are going to create problems for us. They're going to modify the global state of the machine in a way that the virtual machine cannot do, right? So we'll talk about how to fix that. And finally, again, this is the safety criteria, right? That the virtual machine monitor has to ensure that applications, including potentially an operating system running inside the virtual machine, don't make changes that are visible outside the virtual machine, right? So if the operating, when you start up the uh, virtual machine as an application, and the operating system says, here's the memory that's allocated to you, you can't 
let the things running inside the virtual machine make changes to other parts of memory. Right? Uh, and, and there's some complications of this, particularly because one of the things that you're running inside a virtual machine is used to making global changes to the system, right? namely the operating system. All right, so there are, there are two different approaches to virtualization, right? Or, or you know, I, there's probably more than two, actually, but there's two that we're going to talk about, right? The second one, which we'll talk about on Friday, is what's called para-virtualization, right? And para-virtualization means that we're going to require some small number, hopefully, of changes to the operating system in order to allow it to run inside the virtual machine, right? So we're going to say, okay, you know, there's a couple of you know, we didn't really mean to do this with hardware, and so there's a couple of little changes that we're going to need to make, right? And, and the, the efforts to make those changes are supposed to pay off in terms of increased performance. Full virtualization, on the other hand, means this idea that I should be able to take a copy of Windows 7 that was compiled and designed to run on real physical hardware and run it inside a virtual m machine unmodified, right? So again, the guest operating system has no idea or, or, let's put it this way, shouldn't have to make any changes to run inside the VM, right? Okay, so, so again, here's our goal, right? We have this application, the, uh, the unmodified operating system, and we want to run it inside a virtual machine, right? And VMware and VirtualBox and other uh, software solutions essentially allow you to run that virtual machine monitor as an application, right? So you boot up your virtual box, and it just starts running, and, and essentially there is your little copy of Windows running inside an application. So why is this hard? What is hard, what is hard about this? There's a couple th I mean, there's a lot of things that are hard about it, right? But what's, what's one thing that's hard in particular about the, uh, app, about the operating system that's running, the guest OS? What about multiplexing? Well, okay, but let's, let's say I get around that problem. Let's say what I do is when I start up the VM, I just give it a static set of resources. And I think actually this is what some of these systems do, right? When they start up, they just request a certain amount of memory, like a, a big chunk of memory from the underlying host operating system, and then they just use that, right? So again, and to some degree, they do that because the guest operating system is not used to the amount of memory change right, on the system. That's kind of a weird thing. And there's actually some hackish ways to work around this. But guest operating systems, especially unmodified ones, aren't used to you reaching into the machine and grabbing out 512 megs of memory or sticking in a gig halfway through execution. That doesn't really tend to work out very well, right? Um, so let's say I just I pick a static set of resources when I start up the virtual machine monitor and that's all that I use for the virtual machine, right? So now what's hard about supporting the things that are going to run inside the virtual machine? What is, so what is the operating system inside the virtual machine? What are some of the things that it's going to do that I need to be concerned about? So what, what pieces of hardware on the system might it try to manage that might uh, pierce, as we put it, the, the virtual machine? Might give it access to other resources on the system? So the, it, right, so okay, TLB, right? So the TLB and virtual man memory management are great examples of this, right? So on an x86 system, remember I have this uh, hardware managed TLB, but you can, you know, it, does, it doesn't really matter, right? If I'm an operating system running inside the guest, o if I'm the guest OS, sorry, man, I just this stuff messes with my mind a little bit too, actually, it gets complicated. So if I'm the guest OS, how can I, and, and again, remember, the goal of the virtual machine monitor is to prevent the guest operating system from accessing pieces of memory it doesn't have access to on the system, right? How would it do this? What's one easy way that the guest OS, if left un, sort of unsupervised, could gain access to any part of the memory on the system? What's that? I don't know, but, but, I mean, what, but again, if I was just running like an unmodified operating system, right? Let's say it's running with full privilege. What can it do? I mean, you guys are writing, writing kernel code that does this right now, right? Well, first of all, depending on the architecture, it might just have access to, like, again, the MIPS architecture that you guys are using has an area of memory that is, just provides direct mapped access onto potentially all of memory, right? So I can just use those addresses and they work fine, right? 
But let's say I have to map, let's say the kernel has to use the TLB as well, right? So the kernel has to load entries in the TLB, but I'm the kernel, so what can I do? No, let's say I want to access a physical page, right? I know which physical page I want to access. What do I do to access that page? I just load an entry into the TLB, right? I'm the kernel. I manage the TLB, right? So if I run the guest operating system in privileged mode, it can just do all sorts of things, right? It's essentially the host operating system. So the host operating system is supposed to be running in privileged mode. It's supposed to be able to do this. The guest operating system thinks it's running in privileged mode. And so it's going to try to do things like this. It's going to try to write things into the TLB. So we have a choice. Can we let it do that? Does anybody think we can let it just, the guest operating system, just write anything it wants to into the TLB? No, because then it's the host operating system. Right? And then it can see any part of memory it wants. Right? The other, the other case that's hard is, what do we do when an application that runs inside the guest operating system executes a system call, for example, or you know, has a virtual memory exception? Who needs to handle this? So I've got an application. I, you know, think about it. I, I, your your uh, System 161 simulator running inside VirtualBox, running inside whatever it is, Windows. Okay? So actually, Windows is a good example. So it makes a system call. Who needs to handle that system call? Windows? The guest OS. But how do I get to the guest OS? Because if it executes an instruction that traps in the operating system, which operating system do I need to trap into? I need to get to the guest OS. But what it turns out is going to happen is I'm going to end up in the host OS. right? So this is another issue. And, and, and again, as we said, the guest OS will try to execute these privileged instructions. Right? So this is one of the things that, that makes full virtualization hard. All right. So let me, let's, let's walk through one example before, before people go of, of how this works, because I think I've like unraveled a ball of, I feel like I've unraveled a big ball of yarn and I haven't put it back together yet. So, um, all right, so, uh, okay, so the, 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 the goal here is that all traps and exceptions originating inside the virtual machine have to be handled first by the virtual machine monitor and eventually by the guest operating system, right? I mean, in, if, if, let's say you're using VirtualBox on Windows and you're using the Linux environment for this class. Windows doesn't even know how to handle those traps, right? The, 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 you're not even making a Windows system call. Windows is going to be like, what is this? You know, like, I don't even know what that number is that's loaded into the register that tells me what to do and that the arguments are all wrong. Like, Windows would just punt, right? Actually, I hope it would probably just kill the process, right? So eventually, when an application running inside the guest OS traps or makes a system call, I need to get the guest OS to handle that, right? So here's, so here's what happens. Most of the time, the guest OS applications and the guest OS normally use the physical processor normally, right? This is when they're executing instructions that are safe to execute normally, right? Simple stuff, adds, you know, subtracts, branching, anything like that, right? So these are just executed normally, right? But when an application running inside the virtual machine on the guest OS makes a system call, the first thing that's going to happen, OK, so the first thing that's going to happen, sorry, is that because of the fact that you know, I, need to, I, I need to allow the host OS to manage the machine. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to trap into the host OS. The host OS needs to know that the virtual machine monitor is actually what needs to handle this trap. right? So I trap it in the host OS. The host OS is going to hand off that trap to the virtual machine monitor. Is this something that normally happens on systems? Do I normally get to tell the operating system that I should be able to handle traps that, handle in, that, that happen inside my application? No. no, right? So normally virtual machine monitors require special kernel drivers or other kernel support on the host OS to allow them to work, right? Otherwise, the host OS would just fail. It would say, oh, this is a weird looking trap, and it would kill the process or, or you know, it would do something wrong, right? So I hand off the trap to the VMM. The VMM I, inspects this system call, right? And essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to invoke the guest operating system, right? It knows where the guest operating system is, it knows where the guest operating system system call entry point is. And it's just going to branch to that point and, get, and set up things properly so the guest operating system, it just looks like a system call happened, right? Remember, what happens when a system call happens normally? I jump to a specific place, 
a specific address and I start executing code, right? So as long as I can get to that specific place in the guest operating system with the argument set up properly, I'm okay, right? And this is actually what happened. So the VMM looks at it, says, okay, an application inside the, the virtual machine trying to make a system call. I know where the system call handlers are for the guest OS, so I'm just gonna jump to that portion of code, right? So now I'm in the guest OS. This is good, this is what I wanted to do, okay? When the guest OS is done, what it's gonna do is it's actually going to try to execute a privileged instruction, right? On MIPS, this would be something like return from exception, right? That's an instruction that's normally not allowed to be executed if I'm not running in kernel mode, right? And it turns out, as I'm gonna, we'll talk about in a sec, the guest OS is not running in kernel mode. It's actually running in user mode. Man, uh, I need like three more slides to make this all clear. Um, so what's, what's going to happen is that the VMM, the, the host, I'm gonna trap again into the host operating system, right? The host operating system is gonna hand that track back to the virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor is going to see that the guest OS has finished processing the system call and it's going to restart the process that trapped in the first place, right? So I've turned this, on a normal system, this would be two boundary crossings, right? I would go from the application to the OS and back. On a virtualized, on a virtual machine, this is four. I go from the guest OS to the host OS, back to the, so I go from the application to the host OS to the guest OS, back to the host OS, back to the application, right? And the virtual machine monitor is what's interposing here. We will go over this again on Friday, right? Because this is, this, this is, this is tough stuff to get your head around and there probably should be more pictures, all right? And on Friday we will continue talking about how do we get the guest operating system to work despite the fact that it does not have its usual kernel privileges. All right, see you then.